I always like to start talking about five faces with uh, a small story about my son, Eric, now eight, is one of many kids that have been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder or something similar to that. And so what that means is that he has a lot of trouble following teachers in, in, his, in the classroom, and he has even a lot, a, a really hard time uh, doing homework or even finishing exercises, simple exercises for other kids. But what he doesn't have a problem with is standing or building a structure for two hours, focusing on his Legos without any disruption throughout that time. He doesn't have a problem uh, coming up with a cubist interpretation of uh, something he has seen before and spending an hour and a half drawing that to the best of his abilities in the way that he's interpreted that. And so, uh, what I did was to, what any parent would do, I designed a workshop just for him. And it turned out that this workshop, which I call the Magic Cubes, was all about folding paper. Folding paper because I noticed that the moment the hands of the kids are involved, there is that they are the attention grabber. If I have to use my hands, I'm watching. And so origami turned out to be a great vehicle to get that attention that, that apparently was very hard to, to get for other teachers. And so we built a whole series of of exercises just around the folding and combining the folding with many other um, techniques and, and, and learnings, including electronics. It was quite fascinating to see it. And of course, my son became almost a master of this skill and, and eventually learned to teach other kids how to do this. So I thought that was a, a great story. At some point, we thought, oh, we should do a video of this so other kids and other people can learn about the way we have learned, we have engaged these kids, uh, kids that had problems learning other things. And so we went and put together a few videos and, and uploaded to YouTube and you know, that was it. YouTube, uh, just like us, there are, now is getting about a hundred hours of video every minute. Who is uploading all this video? From where? <laughs> well, your kids. While you're sitting here listening to me, the kids are at home taking their iPads, running around the house, and uploading every single minute of their life to YouTube. That's how they make those 100 hours per minute. And so, oops, sorry. Kids have taken control of the YouTube process. Um, we adults, you know, we watch television um, one show at a time. We take one episode every week. We process what we just watched and have to wait for the next episode next week before we are ready uh, to, to proceed with the story. Kids, they're going to have multiple screens open at the same time and they're going to be watching several webisodes and combining and making, realizing that, well, you know what, I didn't like that plot, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my toys and I'm going to re remix and reinvent what I just saw into a new video and make it part of the, of the story. And now the kids have figured out how to participate in the production process. Stop motion iPads, YouTube, and all of a sudden, they're not just watching television, they are producing all the media they could, they could possibly need. Already, Marsha McLuhan uh, had anticipated that television would bring society back to its tribal ways. Tribal as in, you know, the way we Transfer culture is by communicating orally, by talking to each other. Before that point, before television, it was the book. We, the literate man, we had to read one book at a time to absorb the culture of our ancestors. But now with television, that process was going to go back to its former ways. And so, 
what we have now is that process where we are now depending on an acoustic, acoustic world. And by acoustic, I mean there are many things happening at once. You're in the middle of the room, well, certainly listen to me, but you're also aware of all other things and small uh, signals are coming from all around you. And that's what we are becoming used to with this bombardment of media that comes from every single angle. And so, now we have the possibility of not just taking one signal at a time, but taking many of these signals, many of these uh, videos, shows, uh, le lessons, anything that I can put in a, in a television screen, in a video screen, in any kind of screen, I can use, absorb, take the pieces I need, remix, and continue producing. Just like kids figure out how to remix their favorite shows into the uh, possibility of an alternate plot, they now have this massive arsenal of media that has been produced by everyone else before them as the foundation for them to create their own stories. So that is the brave new world in which our kids are going to grow up or are growing up in. How do we help them? Well, uh, most of us parents, the first thing we did was, oh, let's, let's buy them an iPad and give them an iPad. That should be enough. And yeah, certainly, uh, magically enough, the kids already knew how to use the iPad, right? Uh, they already knew how to turn it on, how to put on the camera, and run like crazy around the, around the, ha the house filming uh, every detail of our lives. So certainly, we didn't have to teach them how to shoot video, or <laughs> we didn't have to teach them how to upload that video to YouTube. I don't know how, they know. So what we started trying to figure out is, it, so what is it that they're missing? Because I don't, I, maybe it's me being a parent, but I don't think they, they have all the tools they need to really be proper, good digital citizens. And so the work was really all about trying to de de define and, 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 and design what a digital literacy course would look like if I was trying to teach video. And through a number of conversations with people in the field and through a number of uh, you know, trying to gather what little there was a, out there a couple of years ago, uh, we came up with a few very simple things. One, well, of course, you want to teach your kids proper technique, yeah? Because it's not cool to watch a video that was done like this. We all get dizzy. So we teach the kids, you know, grab the phone. Put, put your hands on the phone in, a, in such a way that it doesn't move. And don't do it like this, you know? That's the way the, the device was designed, but all of us have screens that look more like this. Landscape, not, or not vertical. We also uh, talk about the fact that whatever they put on YouTube, for example, will be shared. I don't th maybe they, they know it, but I don't think they get it. If I put something up, that video is no longer my video. It is a video that belongs to everyone else, or at least we try to teach them that that's the way it should be. So, if you're not comfortable with the idea that that video you're just shooting belongs to everyone else, for them to do whatever they please with that, don't do it. Don't shoot it, don't, don't put it on YouTube. And that starts to create that mindset of, all right, this is not just about me shooting video, this is about me participating in the process of adding to the commons of that massive vault of media that is becoming our foundation to teach the new generations. And of course, we talk about public, private, uh, you know, my face, is it cool to shoot someone's face and put it in YouTube without their permission, and those sort of things, and you know, they're little details, but they get them. They get these sort of things. And eventually, this starts to create the foundation for what we call remix culture. A culture in which the kids, are, they're already acting the part. They just don't necessarily know all the rules of it. But acting the part means that I'm okay 
shooting everything and grabbing the snippets of video from other sources and remixing that with my own creations to put together something new for other kids to enjoy. And that remixing is fundamental to continue building our culture. And that's the, the, the way kids are wired. We just want to do it. We just want them to do it right. So our workshops, of course, and this, this is a lesson I learned through my son, you need the kids to have something in their hands, otherwise they won't pay attention to you. So we gave them iPads. The iPads in their hands, and now we got their attention. But it's also about the ma maneuverability of the iPad, right? Like this, the finger, the gestures, and everything, it just creates that effect of, okay, I'm engaged now. So we designed an, a, an application that's all about you know, simplifying this process of shooting, creating my clips, and then not just creating my clips or using my clips, but reusing all the clips available within my group to create my stories. Now, the stories we tell them are uh, always groups of four. And this is, you know, it sounds very weird, but why would I pick just four clips to make a story? Well, you know, just because we could and we had to create a constraint for them to work with. What is amazing is the kids adapt to that medium. And before you know, they are creating fantastic stories, fantastic stories only with four little vignettes. Now, I want you to imagine that these four clips are actually little looped uh, videos that are moving. I couldn't get it into the presentation, but when you go to the application and when the kids are producing these little stories, they're all moving in the language they like. Uh, they, they, the kids uh, took something that uh, was invented back in the 80s, the GIF, and the animated GIF, and they have made that into a, 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 a fantastic way to express themselves in the form of a moving image. It's just a little video. Uh, for, uh, for us adults, that's the way we should uh, understand it. But the point here is that the kids use these four clips to tell their stories. And when we see that, that, when we see that result, when we see that they're capable of shooting something around them and picking the right elements of that story and combining them into this and into this mosaic of clips, it kind of reminds me of my son giving me my, his interpretation of, of some art in a cubist uh, approach in which they're seeing all the different faces of that story and they want to represent that story through this medium. And so what we learned, of course, although we started as a workshop to teach them proper remix culture, proper technique to shoot video, what we learn is that it's all about the stories. It's all about teaching the kids how to tell a story. Help them understand that they already know how to tell a story. That oral tradition I was referring to, that we're trying to rescue and bring back into our tribal ways, well, it's all about that story. You've seen a movie. That movie that you just saw last week, you can give me that movie, summarize that movie in four sentences, can you? Now think of those four sentences and now picture some, some visual that will reinforce those ideas. You got it? All right, now let's move on and look around yourself and see if you can spot something that will help you build that visual. Run with the iPad and shoot it. Five, ten seconds at most. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about the details. You got it? Now upload it to the server, let it crunch, and now you have your four clips. Once you have your clips in the cloud, in this, in this massive vault of media that I can use to build my story, now I can easily spot the story. I can spot the story of the girl and the boy who met in the alley while she was walking the dog. And so at this point, we have realized the kids have such a tremendous way to create their stories. They need just a little help to digest the process. And we think we are on something really interesting here. Um, stories are everywhere. And that's really what we want the kids to learn, is that they already have the skills. They just need to start pushing those stories out, and they will be famous for them. It's been very gratifying running what we call the Remix the City workshops uh, over the last 
year, uh, it was even, it's, it's very exciting to think what we can do with this in, in, the, in the future. Uh, certainly we had the opportunity to bring this to uh, a group of about 150 to 200 kids, uh, to groups, uh, some of which I see represented here in the room. And, uh, but really we would like to do this not just for a few privileged kids that have parents that have worried about their being good digital citizens. We want every single kid to have this opportunity to learn or master these skills so they're all on that level ground of becoming productive digital citizens that are not consumers of content, that are producers, producers of that massive vault that is our, the culture we're going to inherit to our kids. Thank you very much.